Hi! In this video I will show you Fermat's formality test extended into the miller rabin formality test. We will work on the Fermat formality test that we developed in the previous video and we will correct one of the flaws that we saw in the um, Fermat formality test to make this test uh, correct. This is going to be a slightly larger video because it contains a little bit of math. The Rabin uh, formality test is an extension of Fermat's formality test with uh, some corrections that make it uh, a correct test. Remember that the Fermat formality test is a flawed formality test as we saw in the previous video. Uh, before we go on to the uh, miller rabin formality test, let's take a look at Fermat's theorem one more time. And uh, this is going to help us um, figure out the um, miller rabin test. So, as you remember, Fermat's theorem says that if I have a prime number and I take a base that is within the group, This means that raising the base to pi, uh, p minus 1 gives us a 1 if we were working modulo p. And um, one thing to observe here in this theorem is that this exponent here, p minus 1, if we're talking about uh, any prime except for 2, um, this is going to be a number that is even because prime numbers are generally odd and the previous number of a prime number is even. So this means if we write out, um, let's say we write it out as phi, if we write phi as p, uh, p minus 1, then that means that phi is an even number and so that means we can write it out as 2 times something. And in fact, uh, that something else may also be even. So we can take out all the two factors of, of phi and um, we can write this as 2 to some power times a number that is odd. Okay, so let's write this out as 2 to the r times d where um, this number d is going to be an odd number. So we start with uh, with phi, which is even, and we take out all the two powers until we're left with an odd number d. So that's the basic idea of the um, that is used in in Miller Rabin, and we're going to see exactly how this is used. But uh, before we go on to that, let's code out exactly how we can write this, uh, this phi into this form of 2 to the r times d. Let's go to our, um, our console. We have already developed uh, the um, various primality tests that we uh, saw in the previous video, the so Euclidean, uh, or, I'm sorry, the Eratosthenes primality test and also the um, for my primality test, so right now we're going to do Miller Rabin, and um, of course, as in all primality tests, we will um, take a candidate prime. Let's call it P just to conform to the uh, Fermat's little theorem notation, and uh, I'm going to evaluate phi, which is going to be uh, P minus one, and then what I want to do is I want to write phi as two to the r times d. So I'm going to start taking out powers of two out of phi. And what I'm left with when no powers of 2 remain, uh, I'm going to call d. So I'm going to start with d is equal to p minus 1. And while there is powers of 2 to take out of d, I'm going to keep dividing d with 2, and I'm going to keep increasing r. So I start r at uh, 0, and I do this operation here. So let's actually try it out. Um, let's let's call this with 103 and see what happens. If I print d is equal to this and then r is equal to that, it's going to be dr. And uh, let's see if it works out. So d is 51 and r is 1. And that means the number can be written as 51 times 2 to the first which is 102, which is the phi in case of p is equal to 103. So that seems correct. 
and uh, maybe we can try maybe we can try with another prime number. Let's uh, let's list the prime numbers. Uh, let's try another one. Maybe we can take uh, I don't know four ninety nine. Let's see if it has more powers of two inside. This also has a few. Let's try five sixty nine. See that works better for us. Okay, five sixty nine. It claims that r is equal to three. So let's try it out. It's two to the third, and you can see it's actually five sixty eight, which is correct. It's phi for the case of p is equal to five sixty nine. And you can see in all of these cases, d is uh, an odd number. The whiteboard and um, observe a fact about the uh, square roots of unity modulo some number. So let's say we are working modulo some number p, which is a, a prime number. Let's assume that p is in primes. And um, now, um, what is a square root of unity when we're working modulo p? Well, a square root of unity, let's call it q, is a number that when squared is equal to 1 if we're working modulo p. And one fact about prime numbers is that the square roots of uni unity are only trivial. And what this means is that for, for p being a prime, either q is equal to 1 or q is equal to minus 1. So we have this little fact here. And you can see readily that if q is equal to minus 1, then of course it's going to be a... Um, a um, uh, a, a square root of unity modulo p, and if it's a 1, it's going to be a square root of unity. So essentially, if we have minus 1 square, it's going to be congruent to 1 modulo p, and if 1 is square, then of course it's going to be 1 modulo p. And these are called trivial roots of unity. But in order to see why, um, why we can't uh, have non-trivial roots of unity, if we were working modulo a prime number, let's assume that we had some number. Uh, let's see, let's let's say we had some number um, that was a square root of unity. Let's say we had a number q that was not equal to one or minus one. Uh, we can write out q as the product q plus one q minus 1, and this is still going to be congruent to 1 modulo p, and, um, oops, this is going to be, uh, sorry, this is going to be congruent to 0 modulo p, and this can be done because, of course, we can bring 1 here to the, uh, to the other side of this equation, we can write this as q squared minus 1, which expands to this identity, and so, um, observe that what this equation means here q plus 1 times q minus 1 is congruent to 1 modulo p. This means that this part of the equation, uh, when divided by p, gives a modulo of 0. So that means that p is a perfect divisor of this expression. So p perfectly divides this expression. And um, we know that if a prime number perfectly divides a product of two numbers, um, q plus 1, q plus q minus 1, then this means that the, pro the prime number must divide one of these two expressions exactly. Uh, and that follows from the fact that every number can be written uh, as the product of prime numbers. So we have that either p divides q plus 1, so that means that q plus 1 is congruent to 0 in modulo p, or um, p divides q minus 1. So that's that. And from these, it follows that either q is congruent to 1 or q is congruent to minus 1. So you can readily see that um, we cannot have a square root of unity that is not a trivial square root of unity if we were working modulo some, um, some prime number. Okay, so given that, we can, we can go back to the code and, um, and start implementing this, but... Um, let me show you just some uh, something, just one more thing. Um, observe that if we have this um, this phi here, as written in this in this peculiar way, why do we have to write this in this way? Well, uh, remember from from math theorem we have this identity there, so we will know that if if p is prime, then 
a to the p minus 1 is going to be equal to 1. And if we, if, if, if we find that this is not true, of course, we mark the number as composite. This is the same as for Matt's primality test. But um, what we will do is, instead of raising a to the p minus 1, what we will do is we will raise a to the 2 to the r times d, which is exactly the same. But we will do this in steps. So first we will start with a raised to the power of d, and then we'll move on to a raised to the power of 2 to the d, then we'll do um, 2, well, to the first power here, to the second power here, to the third power of 2 here, and so on and so forth, until we reach a to the 2 to the r times d. So you can see this is a sequence that approaches this number, and of course it may contain just one or two terms. It will contain at least, well, it will contain at least this term here, which is phi, and it will also contain one more term, one previous term, um, just necessarily because r is going to be at least um, at least equal to one. So um, if this is a prime number, well that we're testing, this is necessarily going to be 1, otherwise we're going to say composite. And then that means that the previous number in the sequence is going to be, well, there's three cases. There's three cases here. Either it's going to be 1, or it's going to be 1, minus 1, or it's going to be something else, right? Um, and observe, if it's a 1, then we can, um, well, this is a trivial square root of unity, right? So on, as we go back in this sequence, we are basically taking a square root of unity and uh, this is this can be seen as for example if we go from this number to well this number and this number is equal to 1 then this number here is going to be a square root of unity because well what we did to get from here to there is we basically squared this number right so this 2 is multiplied in and this power becomes a from 3 to a 4 so um, so that means that um, if we have here a 1, then this number here is going to be a square root of unity. And if this number is a 1, then that means that it's a trivial square root of unity. If it's a minus 1, then that also means it's a trivial square root of unity. However, it's a, if it's a different number from 1 and minus 1, then that means that this number is not a trivial square root of unity. And this uh, proves that the number p is not a prime number, it's a composite number, because prime numbers cannot have non-trivial square root of, of unity. Um, and then observe, if we are in the case where this is still a 1, if we move it back in the sequence and it's still a 1, we can still keep doing that and go back one more term. And if we find another 1, then that means um, this is a square root of unity because this is also square root, this is also a unity, right? So we continue in this fashion, and um, if this is a 1, then this is going to be a square root of unity. If we get again a 1, this is a... Uh, trivial, trivial square root of unity. If it's a minus 1, it's a trivial square root of unity. If it's something else, then we know, that, again, that this is a witness of compositeness. Um, and then, again, if it's, a, if it's a 1, if it's a simple 1, we can move back in sequence again, and this is going to be another square root of unity, and it's going to be either 1 or minus 1 or something else. So the idea here is we, we move back in this sequence, and we check if the number is a trivial square root of unity or a non-trivial square root of unity. If we ever find a point where this number is a, uh, a non-trivial square root of unity, we can just break and say the number is composite. If we find a minus 1, we, this is a non-conclusive case, uh, it's a non-trivial square root of unity, well, it's a trivial square root of unity, but we cannot go back because now we're not talking about unity anymore, we're talking about minus 1, which is different. And if we're seeing 1, we can continue in this fashion. So this is the basic idea be, be, uh, behind the miller rabin test, but uh, what I will do in my implementation, instead of starting from the end of the sequence and moving forward, I will start from the beginning and move forward in this way. So I will start by computing a to the dth power. Let me do that. Let me just go here and say, uh, now that I have d, I can use pow, which is the pow mod function. And I take a as a basis, and um, I will raise it to the dth power. And of course, I'm working modulo p minus one, uh, and maybe you can just call this y, just for notational purposes. So I'm calling this phi, and this is my my initial value. Let's call it x. Let's call it x.
capital X, and this is A to the D. And this can be this can be a variety of values. It can be one minus one, or it can be something else. And this is where I start. And uh, similar to the um, the Fermat commodity test, A is going to be a random choice. So after I break my number into D and R, I will uh, do a loop, and uh, I will loop this, uh, and my loop will be parameterized by this K parameter, similar to previously. So I will do I in range K. Um, this is not necessary, okay. And then I will take A to be a round range from 2 to P minus 2, which is exactly the same as the from our multi test, the random import round range. All right, so um, what I will do then is I will repeat a loop inside of this, and I will repeat it R times, and I will take X, and I will square it, right? So you can observe here that we are going through the sequence exactly. We are starting with a sequence that is A to the D, and then we're doing A to the D um, squared, and then we're doing A to the D to the fourth, Right, and then we're doing a to the d to the uh, two to the third, right, and so on and so forth, by adding by by multiplying the exponent of this expression by two, right. So uh, one more time, we have written the phi, which is the exponent. We've written it as a uh, two to the d times r, and r is an odd number. Now, in order to go through this expression, we start by a to the d, and uh, what we do is, in the exponent, we do 2 times d, um, 4 times d, 8 times d, 16 times d, and so on and so forth. So we multiply the d exponent with a power of 2. So let's go back to the whiteboard, and you see it readily right here, that the exponent here starts at d, then it has a 2 times d, a 2 squared times d, a 2 to the third power times d, and this is all in the exponent. So the exponent is what's multiplied by 2, which is equivalent to squaring the number at each step. So I'm moving through the sequence in this, uh, in this fashion, right, like that. Uh, and because we're working modulo some number phi, I will not write x as x bar times equals x, because I want to remain, uh, um, I want to remain modulo phi, so I will write um, x squared modulo phi, just so that uh, the modulo operation is applied. So now we're, um, we are actually going through all of these, um, and what I will do in this test is I will first check if x is equal to 1 or x is equal to minus 1, meaning that the first term in the sequence is a 1 or a minus 1. So if the first term in the sequence is a, is a 1 or minus 1, and this means that the whole sequence is full of 1 or minus 1 because we're just, we just keep squaring it, right? So if this is a 1 or a minus 1, then this is going to be a 1. And as we move forward, all of these are going to be a 1. And that means that, well, of course, the uh, little Fermat's theorem is satisfied for this number. And furthermore, we have not found any square roots of uh, unity that are not trivial. And so in this case, we can just um, continue and try a different A because this A was not a witness for the composedness of P, our candidate. Now, the next idea is that uh, we will loop this R minus 1 times, and um, in every step, we will go to the, next, to the next point here, and we will check if the number that we find is a 1 or a minus 1 or something else. So, once we apply the square, we will check if x is equal to 1, that's one case, or we will check if x is equal to minus 1. And observe that when we are saying minus 1 and we're working modulo some number, what I really mean is p minus 1. Because minus 1 as a, um, well, as a modulo, right, after a modulo operation is congruent to, to p minus 1. And when I apply my modulo operation here in the PAL, this result is going to be between 0 and p minus 1. So I cannot write x is uh, equal to, to minus 1. I have to write x is equal to p minus 1. I have to do the same here, of course. So let's think about these two cases. Let's see what's going on here. If x is equal to exactly 1, then this means that we, well, we first um, went through this first 
term in the expression, and that term was not a 1 or a minus 1, and the next term is a 1. Um, and of course, if we move to this expression um, through the sequence throughout many terms, and at some term we find uh, x is equal to 1, but in no terms we found 1 or minus 1, then that means that this term here is 1, but the previous one was not a 1 or a minus 1. And therefore, in this case, we have found a number that is not 1 or minus 1, and it was squared, and then it gave us a 1, and that's a non-trivial square root of unity. So we can be sure in this case that this number is a composite, so we return false. This is a witness of the compositeness of P. Now what happens if at this point we get that x is equal to P minus 1, which means essentially it's uh, congruent to minus 1. Well, if x is congruent to minus 1, then this means that all the previous terms were either 1 or minus 1. Uh, but this term is minus 1, and all the future terms are going to be exactly 1. Uh, so we find that one of these terms, uh, let's use another color, uh, let's say this, uh, it's one of these terms, just this one that I'm marking in green, is a minus 1. If this is a minus 1, then that means that the next term, which is its square, is going to be exactly equal to 1. And all the future squares are going to be exactly equal to 1. So that means that Fermat's test is satisfied because the final number is going to be equal to 1. Notice that we don't go up to the final number, we just go to the uh, one just previous of it. Okay, so that means we have found a minus 1. However, we have not, we have not found a non-trivial square root of unity, and we don't have any hopes of finding it because from now on we will just see 1. So what we can do in this case, we can just break this test here. And um, what we will do, what this will do is it will exit this loop and it will go to the next A, which is going to be a random test again. Okay, and now the important part is that if this for loop here never breaks, so it never returns, oops, so it never returns, and it also never breaks, so we never saw 1, or we never saw um, p minus 1, then that means that the um, uh, that we have uh, either found a square root of unity or that the last term does not satisfy Fermat's little theorem. And so in this case, we can just say that the number is also composite. Uh, great. So this is the basis of uh, the miller rabin test. And um, if we go through all these trials without finding any witness of compositeness, um, then we can say that the number is prime, or probably prime. So just return true in this case. And this is very similar to what we did with uh, the case of the, um, the Fermat's primality test. So again, of both of these algorithms, they test uh, uh, k different trials, and if none of them witnesses the compositeness of the number, it returns true. So let's see if this works, because it's a quite complicated algorithm. This is false. Um, I don't think this should be false because this is a prime number, but let's try a smaller prime number and see how it works out. And this says false. So let's go ahead and, uh, and debug this code. So uh, first of all, let's make sure that we're doing uh, some random trials. Okay, so it produces 38 and then it says false. Now let's see why it produces false. And in this case, we're saying, okay, um, found a non-trivial square root of unity. In this other case, we can say um, found a violation of Fermat's little theorem. Okay, and I debug this code a little, and uh, the problem here is that I'm doing modulo phi instead of p. So this is the fix there. Um, remember, of course, that uh, here we're working modulo p, not modulo phi, in every case. And, um, well, let's see if this, if this works with this correction. Uh, oops. Let's see. And um, it seems to be trying various different uh, A's, and it's trying 20 ones, 20, 20 different A's, and it's concluding that this is a prime. So this is correct, um, and it seems to be working. That's pretty good. Uh, now let's try a um, different value for the is prime function. 
Um, so let's see a large or a list of large prime numbers. Let's see if we can find a larger prime. Uh, we have uh, maybe the first 50 million primes. That's cool. Okay, so let's take one of the larger primes. This is the 49th millionth prime. Now let's put it in here. And um, because this is a polynomial test, this should work pretty fast. Cool. So this uh, witnesses the well, it doesn't witness the chromology, but um, it tried 20, 20 um, um, possible witnesses for the compositeness, and it failed to find a witness of compositeness, and it says that it's prime, which is true. Now let's try um, a test of uh, compositeness. So let's multiply these two primes together to create a semi-prime, and it should say that this is actually a composite number. And that's cool because it's violating for mass level theorem, so it's, it's false. Let's try one more. Let's try to multiply here with this. And again, uh, it finds such a, a violation. And in fact, we can also try a Carmichael number, and it should um, still work because it should not have this problem that we had with the Fermat, um, the Fermat um, algorithm previously. So let's try this one. see uh, found a non-trivial square root of unity so it found it um, immediately and um, so it works let's remove the print statements and um, to conclude let's do a short uh, complexity analysis of this and you can see this repeats k times so of course we have the accuracy parameter k and then it's doing just uh, well some powers here and then a repetition with respect to to R. Um, so uh, you can see that R is extracted out of the number P, so uh, it's not actually too large. And we can say that, uh, oh, oh, well, of course, also this is a power operation within here. So let's see, all these exponents here are in the order of... Uh, in the order of uh, p, because we're doing modulo p, so we have exponentiations of that sort. Let's call it polylog of p, because exponentiation is polylogarithmic. And then, um, then we have uh, just uh, r different repetitions, and r is here just uh, the uh, logarithm of p again. So this is again multiplied by the logarithm of p, but this is uh, incorporated in the polylog number here. So uh, you can see the, the miller rabin test is polynomial in the size of the input, and this is just the polylog here. And one nice thing about the this primality test is that while it is probabilistic, similar to the Fermat primality test, uh, unlike the Fermat primality test, it doesn't have a flaw. Um, and one fact that we will not prove about this test is that if you try a random witness for any uh, number that uh, is prime or composite, if the number p is composite, then there is a high probability that A will witness its compositeness. And in fact, um, if, if P is composite they're, they're, and you choose a random A, then there is a one quarter chance that you will find a number that is uh, um, a liar for this test, meaning it will not witness its compositeness. So you can see if you repeat, or so, okay, so if you choose a random A, then there is a one fourth probability or four to the minus one probability of this uh, being uh, flawed. But if you repeat this k times, you have a four to the minus k probability of it being flawed. Uh, and so if you take k large enough, like uh, 20, the probability that this is flawed falls exponentially. And so um, the probability that this algorithm will make a mistake is negligible. So let's mention this in the doc string also. So uh, determines whether number p is a prime number works in a polynomial number of or in polynomial complexity and then parameterized parameterized by accuracy factor k returns true or returns false if composite 
um, or true if probably climb um, probability of mistake in case of compositeness uh, 4 to the minus k, um, which is negligible in k. Right, so this concludes the implementation of the Miller Rabin primality test. Using the Miller Rabin primality test, we can test for primality quite large numbers, up to 4,000 digits or even more. This has many applications in cryptography, as we will see in future videos. As always, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. If you have questions or suggestions, leave a comment in the section below. Till next time, so long.